Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with my friend and comrade, Derek Davison. And we are excited to welcome to the pod a bunch of first-timers on our pod, I believe. First, we've got uh, Josh Olson. Uh, Josh is a friend of mine. Uh, He's also the co-host of the new podcast, The Audit, with Dave Anthony. Uh, We've got Kate Willett. Kate, as you probably know, is a stand-up comedian, and she's also the co-host of the Reply Guys pod. And she's also the first guest on The Audit right study buddy yeah study buddy it's the first study buddy on the audit and then we've got david sirota and you definitely know him david is the founder and editor chief of lever news and he's also a recent oscar nominee and i was telling josh before the podcast this is our first but no doubt not last podcast with two oscar nominees so <laughs> thank you both I, for joining us <laughs> thanks for I having think me this is, this is the first time i've ever felt insecure about not being an Oscar nominee. You know, <laughs> like I haven't had that one yet come up for me. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, one if it makes you feel better, do, Kate, I'd like to point out we're both Oscar losers. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got to, we got to trade up to Oscar winners next time. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We'll get you that's, some. That's yeah. definitely. The, one of our goals is to induce neuroses in people. So I'm glad we were able to do it's that like, very quickly in the podcast. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, but why don't we just get, get going with talking about sort of, Josh in particular and, and David and Kate, feel free to jump in. What is this new podcast and what made you want to do it? And maybe Josh, you could even give some context because you've been engaged in a deranged Julia and Julia style scheme for the last few years to watch and comment on all the episodes of the West Wing. So how does this emerge from that quote unquote project? Well, that's actually Sirota's fault. Um, <laughs> we, uh, my friend Dave Anthony, who is not with us, who is my co-host uh, on the audit, but he is currently on tour with his other co-host, my sister wife, uh, on his uh, other podcast, uh, The Dollop. They're touring the country right now, and I think they're in a van somewhere in the Midwest. So, But yeah, Dave and I, uh, based on a drunken conversation we had a few years ago, ended up doing a podcast called The West Wing Thing. Well, we did. We d- went through every single solitary episode of The West Wing, minus one that had no political content, and dissected its terrible, terrible, terrible neoliberal politics and explained how they're still valid today, how they both reflect and impacted uh, the state of the Democratic Party and how they led us to Donald Trump. And um, both folks here with us, David Sroda and Kate, uh, have both been on the show a couple of times. And we were talking uh, every now and then we just we, we couldn't take it anymore and we'd take a little <laughs> break and we would do things like we did a breakdown of the Hillary Clinton masterclass in resilience, which uh, I, I if you're looking for tips on how to be resilient, I do not recommend it. Um, and we'd had a lot of fun. We had some guests, including Kate came on and, and we sort of broke it down over a couple of episodes. And we were thinking about doing another one. And I thought, hey, you know what? I'm 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 in with Sirota now. He he knows everybody. And I called him up and I said, <laughs> Hey, do you think you could get us some, you know, high powered guests for this next masterclass? Wow, Hollywood doing? insiders. That's right. Looting <laughs> behind the scenes. That is that is yeah. right. And uh uh I think, yeah, we were both like it was at some after Oscar party. We were just doing mountains of cocaine. It was uh and, <laughs> and but here's the thing with with David, which is so crazy, he he goes, I have a better idea. He goes, aren't you guys almost done? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, why don't you? And he just literally pitches us the audit, you know, verbatim, which is um, we're going to do, we're doing a series of kind of mini series, four or five or six episodes uh, along a theme. And we will have uh, a guest host for each of them, which we call our study buddy. Kate was our first. And we will walk through not just, just master classes, but all kinds of things, um, docu-series, audio books, you name it, whatever catches our fantasies, uh, our fancies. And, um, <laughs> and fantasies is the case. Yeah, and fantasies, make. yeah. And we started, what better way to start? George W. Bush had just announced that he was doing a master class in leadership. And, and so he did that. And, um, uh, we became, I guess we're the second podcast. Is that correct? Over on the, on the lever network. Yes. The and, second one. Which is terrifying because up until then, um, we were not in any way, shape, or form what you might consider legitimate. 
<laughs> we're just we're just rude. I don't assholes. consider myself legitimate. I speaking for the for the lever. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think I'll ever consider myself a quote unquote I legitimate. Hate to break it to you. Uh, <laughs> and is anybody listening? Not know. I mean, the lever is like this amazing investigative journalist. Thank I, you. In fact, um, Dave was the one who Dave Anthony mentioned. It was like it's crazy. Every time I sort of find some great investigative reporter I really like and follow, they end up getting snatched up and working over at the lever. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, so we're we're doing that now, and we have a couple more episodes of uh, George W. Bush to go. Then we're going to take a couple weeks off, and then we're coming back with our next one, and and um, it is lots and lots of fun. So in some sense, it's really a, a show of media critique, and I think this emerges directly from the West Wing project, which is effectively a show of um, uh, your show uh, was was about the the West Wing thing was really about criticizing this as a media. Project. Yeah. So uh, to, to David or Kate, I, I was wondering, what do you think of the left, left-wing left media ecosystem today, kind of post-Bernie and, and where what's happened? Because there was this big buildup um, really post-2016 and then in the run-up to 2020, and obviously the Bernie loss is a, is a moment, and there's been a fracturing. So I'm just curious where you see the lever news or Kate, where you see your own work on reply guys or stand up fitting into this ecosystem that is really, I think a little bit in transition. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer and then keep it, keep it short because David probably has <laughs> totally different and probably better thoughts. I mean, for me, like as a, you know, podcaster and someone that like lives, lives in Brooklyn, I know a lot of like lefty media type people, uh, IRL, um, and, you know, I think like, uh, best case scenario, like there's a lot of people that I think felt pretty devastated by Bernie's loss and have kind of, you know, rechanneled to more like local things, like trying to get people elected, you know, in New York or Los Angeles, you know, uh, talking with activists, you know, maybe making stuff that kind of gives historical context, like worst case scenario, we've seen people pivot to like full on, you know, being like a getting into weird anti-vax stuff. I'm trying not to subtweet, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, for sure, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, you know, I think that there was that, a, you know, there was a moment where it felt like, um, Oh wow. You know, like there's all these people who are, uh, into the same thing, but then, you know, once kind of Bernie, uh, was no longer running, it be- became clear. There's, it's actually like, there's there's all kinds of people that uh, believe different things and you know there was like a, a coalition that came together behind bernie but that coalition included people that you know are now like pretty right wing and people that are like you know very normal democrats and people who are socialists and i think we're just kind of seeing it was a lot more varied you know i i would say uh when on the question of of media um specifically where are we with kind of uh progressive leaning media um frankly i think it's um it's still pretty bleak i i think that it's bleak but the, but there are there are pinpoints of of bright spots i i think we're now living in a i mean i have a sort of a grand overarching theory of 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 media right now you have kind of obviously corporate media you have far right media and and corporate media and far right media are robust uh within corporate media you have kind of left i i guess i would call it democratic party media msnbc um you know i i think like the new york times op-ed page pod save america i mean this is like big d democrat media and it's it's very well capitalized as well um, with lots of resources. Uh, and then I think you have a kind of media, um, you've got kind of a foment. I don't even want to call it on the, I don't even like the term far left, but I think there's like a media space that's like sort of both parties are terrible. Everybody is terrible. It's like kind of like a nihilist media like uh, where it's just like everything is awful all the time. Nobody can be trusted, and that and and by the way, I think there's crossover on the right and left there. I think it kind of it kind of blends over there, and that gets a lot of, of noise. And I think the problem is, is that there's very little 
what I would call um, left of center or populist left of center or populist left of the Democratic Party media that is uh, decently capitalized, uh, that has a critique of both parties, but has not slipped over into, you know, it's all terrible all the time. Nothing can be hoped for. The entire system uh, has no value at all. And so I, what I'm trying to say is I think that um, the, the space that we uh, exist in is investigative, um, serious, fact-based reporting as opposed to um, just opinion. Uh, and it's serious fact-based reporting from a kind of populist left of center perspective. And it sometimes feels like it ends up being in no man's land. Like that, yeah. that there's a bigger audience. If you just say, you know, they're all horrible, that both parties are exactly the same. Like there's plenty of media, like sound and fury in that. Uh, there's plenty of sound and fury in the idea like, oh, the, you know, the Democrats are great. The Republicans are bad. The Republicans are great. The Democrats are bad. There's plenty of sound and fury over there, but there's just not a lot of like, well-capitalized, real, original journalism, as opposed to just, you know, opinion, but actually reporting and uncovering stuff from the perspective that, for instance, the lever exists in. And that's a real bummer because that really, to, to my mind, that's where reality actually is. That's really interesting. And of course, investigative reporting takes a lot of time and a lot of money and its immediate pecuniary benefit isn't, isn't nece it doesn't necessarily have an immediate pecuniary benefit, which is, you know, over time, I'm sure you're all aware, has led to significant critiques of capitalist media as a project, right? Like if you're constantly searching for clicks, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, then it's going to, you're going to spend less time spending three years investigating the local school board necessarily. Um, so that, I think that that is like crucial, crucial work that that, that particularly as local uh, journalism effectively dies, you're going to need more independent sources of. But I have a question about audience, and this is really um, to the panel, because one of the theories of the Bernie campaign, I think it was fair to say, is that you would activate voters. You know, people who, quote unquote, are objectively being um, <laughs> oppressed by the system would be subjectively turned on, like they would, they would connect their subjectivity to larger social processes. Um, but I think that proved pretty difficult. So I was just wondering in this fractured media landscape, and I think David, you described it pretty accurately, where does, um, what is the theory of what role media plays in society? Because I think oftentimes on the left, there's a very simplistic narrative of manufacturing consent that is true in some ways and, and overly simplistic in others. So what is the, uh, the theory of change behind the media that you guys see? Why spend all this time sort of dissecting masterclasses in the West Wing? What does independent journalism, investigative journalism actually do if there's no, if the real experience of our era is the decline of quote unquote mass audiences, where now we're all fractured and very individualized? I think for, for me, just to kind of you know, one thing that I've gotten out of left media as just someone who has consumed a lot of it um, is just like a chance to really think about things in a way that, you know, for myself, like I just was not exposed to in any other media. Like, you know, I mean, I've always been very like trying to read the news and stuff like that, but like I didn't necessarily even like understand the framework that like the New York times, you know, the paper record or the Washington post or these sources that were supposed to be consuming, like the biases they have, the way that they're framing things, what they're choosing to report on, you know? And so for myself, like uh, one thing that's very important to me, no matter how many listeners we have like, on my podcast is to try to have guests like, that, that can help people sort of see another side of things. Like this week, we had a long time tenant organizer and that was such a good conversation. I mean, it was like just a perspective that I haven't heard on a podcast before. And I was so glad to be able to, to have him, you know, sort of like just explain like what is, you know, the actual experience of like your job, like, what are you doing? What do you hope for? And, it, you know, it's like, it's, it's not investigative reporting. It's a completely different thing. But, you know, to me, like something huge would be lost if we didn't have any of that stuff. But it's also like, it doesn't make a lot of money either sometimes, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think to, to piggyback on that, I think that the theory behind 
a robust media that, for instance, spotlights corruption or follows the money or uh, doesn't hew to a partisan line, but does have a, a diagnosis of what the overall overarching problem is, aka oligarchy is the problem, that 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 is valuable in trying to ground uh, the discourse that produces policy results. I mean, I think there's it's kind of undeniable that the the discourse, the capital uh, D discourse, is in part what drives policy outcomes. Companies spend a lot of money on ads. They spend a lot of money to sponsor large media outlets, not out of the goodness of their own heart, but to try to shape the discourse. As an example, um, one of the things we've seen most recently in in the media industry is the rise of these um, outlets like Axios or Semaphore, Politico newsletters, um, a punch bowl, where it literally says at the top, uh, they're, the, the day's offering presented by Chevron. I mean, literally, like, and Chevron is not presenting today's episode or issue of uh, Semaphore covering Washington just out of the, you know, an altruistic desire to um, uh, have a, a well-reported journalism. Uh, it is presenting that, it is sponsoring that content uh, in order to shape the larger discourse, which produces policy outcomes, uh, policies that deal with energy, policies that deal with climate, and the like. Uh, so one of the reasons to have uh, an independent media that is not presented by Chevron is so that the discourse has at least an injection of reality in it. Uh, for instance, climate reality or the fact that Chevron is um, Chevron's products are creating uh, a, an ecological crisis uh, that destroys the livable uh, the livable climate. Um, so that I think is what's important. I, and I, and to speak to the audit. I think we have to understand that there are all the media is fragmented. There's all these different channels of information that are that are out there. Uh, master classes is one. Audio books. Like we have to broaden our understanding of what media is. And I think um, one thing it's it, is to look at this, call it out, and say, look at. I mean, look at this sort of um, underlying propaganda system that's below even what's on your you know, cable TV, right? This is a whole other set of streams of information being pumped into the discourse. Look at this. Let's like pull it out here and like ridicule it when it's ridiculous. And then I think the other part of it is, is to say, is not just to, to spotlight how, um, uh, out there, you know, George Bush's or, you know, proclamations are and kind of laugh at them, but to also, also to kind of, I mean, there's a, a kind of enjoyable, um, mirror that's turned on society kind of like, how is a George Bush masterclass a product that people take seriously? I mean, this is the worst president, arguably the worst president in, in modern history, did so much damage. And look, Donald Trump, you know, made a run at being the worst president too. But like George W. Bush it, it sh should never be able to show his face in public uh, in, in a way where he has any prestige. Like, what has happened to our society? in which these ideas, these figures have been mainstreamed, right? I think there's a, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, I do think there's a space for us to, at a meta level, and I think the audit does this really well, is to step back and ask the question, what are we actually normalizing here? Like if George Bush can be normalized, George Bush can be normalized as like a decent politician, a statesman and a decent leader, like, what has gone wrong in our society? Well, and I'd even add to that to, to more layer. I mean, it's really hit me lately. Uh, and we talked about this in some of the later episodes of the, the Bush arc. It's what's really astonishing, too, is the way this stuff is completely ignored by mainstream media. I've seen nothing written about this, right. uh, this thing. And here is a former president of the United States 
openly just rewriting his entire career <laughs> to make himself look nice. I mean, he literally <laughs> says in one episode, like, if you're going to be a good leader, you got to make sure you never impose your religious views on other people. <laughs> I, I can't even that. handle it. It's so funny. And you're sitting there going, where's the fucking New York Times? Why, why is the New York Times not sending somebody just to listen to this? Because it seems to me that George Bush going out and lying blatantly about who he is, it is, is that's noteworthy. You would think nothing. They're not even, you know, they probably have an ad for it, but that's about the extent of their, their uh, coverage of it. And yeah, the degree to which that stuff's normalized. And we felt that he was a great way to begin because not only, you know, we're all still living with the impact of his presidency, but lately there's been this insane thing that is endemic uh, among Democrats where if you just look funny or perhaps clap in an interesting way that can be perceived as defiant in the direction of Donald Trump, you are now a hero of the resistance and all your former crimes are forgiven. And, you know, what is Bush? Bush has said some, made some tepid comments about him and, you know, gone out and campaigned for a couple of people who are n- never Trumpers. And, and now he's a hero. And it's like, what the fuck is happening? How do we, and, and it's not just being vindictive because if you're going to let that happen, you know, how many, what are we, three, four, five years away from, it depends whether or not Trump's reelected, from, you know, Donald Jr. being a CNN consultant. I mean, that's going to happen because he's not going to be as bad as the next Republican, you know? And yeah, and the way the media just sort of goes along and enables that is maddening. I'm just never going to get over how funny it is that there is an episode of this masterclass called Accountability. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> unbelievable. I think the only accountability George W. Bush has ever taken uh, was like by accident when he was trying to talk about Putin and he said uh, Iraq when he meant to say Ukraine. That's it. (laughs) You know, and this guy's out here being like, yeah, to be a leader, you have to be accountable. So I I, I actually want to, I mean, not to disagree with, with the fine panel here, but when I think of leadership, the man who stared terror in the face and kept reading my pet goat is i'm sorry that's the that's who comes yeah, to george mind. w bush I mean, is actually know. a friend of our pod george so. w. Bush. <laughs> sorry about yeah. that. um you know th- that that is leadership to me so i i wanted to to get back to the the show what what have you taken away i mean what, what about you know george w bush's teaching have, are you planning to apply in your own lives uh, to become better leaders, you know, what are the big, big <laughs> wisdom? What's the wisdom that he imparts? Yeah, I don't know. I got mugged last month, so I'm invading my next door neighbor's house. Is uh, <laughs> I, I nothing? I mean, you know, there's that. That's the other thing too. And <laughs> and uh, just to show that we can be even handed here, same thing. We came out of the Hillary Clinton class. I mean, she taught a class in resiliency. Someone who I would argue is one of the least resilient figures in American politics. And we were open. I yeah. would say, weren't, weren't you, Kate? We were very, I think we're all the kind of, uh, you know, assholes who are like, I would love to walk out of the George W. Bush masterclass on leadership and actually have, be able to go, but you know what? I learned a few things about leadership that I, nothing, absolutely nothing. And- I actually, I would disagree with you because I think we did learn one thing. Like, I, I feel like there was one takeaway from that, kind of. Which is like, he is so personable and kind of regular seeming and just not like his whole, his whole thing, even though it's completely fake and he is like this rich guy, like he just doesn't talk down to people. And I think, I do think that we were all really struck with like how much that's true and how much like democratic politicians on the whole do not try to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Just building off of that, what psychic need? do you guys think something like the George W. Bush masterclass or the Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton show fulfill? Like, I think because you had a very clear theory of like, the West Wing is obvious, right? It, it's right. hyper-competency. It's liberal. Right, that, yeah. that if only the best people, yeah. the most meritocratic people, the ones who went to Harvard and Yale were all in charge, um, things would go well. And the Obama era effectively put an end to that fantasy. I think it's a very pre-Obama show. Um but what what is what needs are these things fulfilling post Trump post Obama? So uh, let me let me weigh in on this if I can. I I, I think because <clears throat> I've thought a lot about this. I think there as somebody who I've written my my the last book I wrote which was many years ago at this point was all about um, nostalgia, 
uh, and how the past influences the future. And I do think, you know, the obvious appeal of nostalgia is, um, is you remember, a, you misremember the so-called halcyon days, right? This bygone era. And when the, um, when the wars of the past, wars meaning either the literal wars in George Bush's case or the sort of figurative political wars are over uh, or perceived to be in the past, they become less divisive. You can, they become kind of sanitized. Uh, so there's this, there's this almost like a, like a, like an urge to remember the best parts about the people in the past, uh, and not remember the, the really the worst parts. So I do think all of that is to say, I do think like a George Bush masterclass, part of it is like, I'm going to put my mind, uh, I, the user, I'm going to put my mind back in the past of this time that is going to be sanitized for me, a simpler time. And, and the other comfort of the past, I think, is that you already know the outcome of the past. Like, okay, like nine, like experiencing, I can say, for instance, experiencing 9-11 in Washington, D.C. on 9-11 was a terrifying experience because you didn't know what was going to come next. Now, when you watch retrospectives on it, you at least know that you lived, you survived. I mean, it was terrible. It was a terrible era, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think all that's to say is that I, that I think like somebody like George Bush reminiscing on the past is just an escape into the past and plays on people's desire to think that everything was better in these old golden days, uh, these old, um, these old days where everyone was better, which, which then, I don't know if this is a word, but uh, anomalizes the current Right. It's a, oh, you know, right. Donald Trump talks about uh, how yeah. there's certain things he got done then that you couldn't do today because things are so contentious and, right. and right. You know, there's so much partisan ugliness going on today. And you're sitting there going, your George Carl Rove was your fucking attack dog. Right. Right. And so I think it says like, oh, what's happening today is weird. Like Donald Trump, MAGA, it's, a, it's weird. It's, it's not, not only bad, but it's weird and an anomaly. And now I've got George Bush telling me like, Hey, things were better in the past. Like I, you know, things were better. Uh, you know, it was all cool back then. And you're right. Today is like this weird anomaly when in fact, no, that's not right. George Bush, the 2000, like th there is a direct line that you can trace from the stealing of the 2000 election to George Bush deregulating, helping uh, continue the deregulation of the economy to the financial crisis, to the rise of Trump, to the challenging of election results. Like all those things are intertwined. George Bush doesn't like in, in actual reality, George Bush isn't not a part of that. Like even though his masterclass and his sort of larger image today uh, is designed to present him as like this, you know, uh, old time, you know, statesman like figure like George Bush is integr integrally uh, implicated into what we're experiencing now. And, and I think there's kind of like a sense of comfort in, in uh, to some people, I guess, in thinking that that's not true uh, in watching a masterclass and kind of reminiscing with him. But the problem with it is, is it really is a form of kind of historical revisionism in kind of a really dangerous way. Because if you don't understand how we got here now today, I do believe the trend will continue. And I do believe that history will continue to repeat itself. And it's also to me, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's it represents when you search for nostalgia, when you desire for nostalgia, you're effectively turning away from the present and the future. So a lot of this to me seems to, in some sense, embody the, the elite liberal, the elite bourgeois desire, however you might frame it, to not confront the fact that if they don't want something like a Trump to happen, they're going to actually have to redistribute some of their resources. They're going to actually have to earn less money and things along those lines. And so it also seems to me like a specific turning away from the present and the future. Um, and to me, that that this is why I think that liberalism is actually in crisis, because it's not willing to do what needs to obviously be done. This isn't this give, give people money is not exactly a complicated policy program. It's just, they're no. not willing to do it. So yeah. how, I was just wondering if these, these classes 
fit into that? Do you think that's an accurate understanding? How does this relate to media? I think what David was referring to as a Democratic Party media is essentially an entire psychic program to avoid people having to give up their, for people, to make people think they're not going to have to give up their money. Like it's all disinformation and things along those lines, not resources. So what do you think about that? Or is that wrong? Um, I mean, just the one thing I want to kick back just a little bit on something you said earlier that ties into this, I think, because um, your question, you know, on the one hand, the West Wing was, God help us, an extremely popular television program. It still is to this day. In fact, I, um, if Dave and I have had any impact on the world, it's that if you go on Twitter now and go, hey, I'm rewatching the West Wing and boy, I love this show, <laughs> at least 20 of our listeners are going to dogpile you. <laughs> <laughs> um and every now and then they'll get someone to listen to our show and we'll get a nice letter from them saying we radicalize them. But uh, what we don't know, however, because you mentioned this class, Hillary's class and Hillary's Apple series, um, uh, we don't know if anyone's actually watching or listening. That's the thing. Those numbers aren't available. And But to your, to your other question, I think they're all part of a larger project. I think with both Masterclass and with Apple and with Netflix and the Obama deal where he's making – didn't he just do what like a eighty-seven part series on our national parks? I mean, I, I, who who's <laughs> are even the people who are editing that show watching it? Like I, nobody wants. That's to really see that. interesting. The huge deals that Harry and Meghan got is very interesting. But they're 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 it's not loss leaders. I would say, or maybe they're loss leaders. You know, they're they're, they're look. You know, here we are. We're master class. Um, I mean, I'll be upfront. We haven't discussed this, Sirota, but if we could get George W. Bush to be our study buddy for an hour, <laughs> one of these, we would amazing. absolutely do it. That would be, hey, we got George W. Bush on this. It 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 gives you a kind of legitimacy. We got Bush, we got Hillary Clinton, we got Bill Clinton, we got Carl Rove. You know, Netflix has got Obama, Apple's got Hillary Clinton. It makes it sort of adds to their prestige to people who. I can't even imagine people who are like, oh, hey, that's cool. Uh, Apple did a thing with Hillary Clinton. I love her. You're still not going to watch the fucking thing. But it just gives them this kind of aura, this prestigiousness. That So I got to just very quickly off yeah. that. Okay, so you guys are in Hollywood. How have you seen the blending of Hollywood uh, politics and celebrity? Because I think what Obama and Harry and Hillary have done the last 50, Bush didn't do that initially when he left office. Clinton right. started an NGO, right? These are different things. Jimmy Carter went and built houses. Reagan, you know, uh, he yeah. was <laughs> senescent. But what is this move toward politicians, particularly presidents, the most powerful people on earth, in their post-presidency going to Hollywood? That, to me, is a very interesting and strange phenomenon and a new phenomenon. Well, that's well, Obama. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 think it's, I think it's a sad commentary on our um, larger... A political world in this way. I, I think that the politician as celebrity is a deeply unhealthy problem. And to be clear, any any politician who's a president uh, is going to be famous. There's a difference between fame and celebrity. I think it's an, an important distinction. And I, it's, it's kind of hard to define, but I think obviously any, like Joe Biden is famous, but I would argue Joe Biden is not a celebrity. Uh, uh, and I guess my point is, that I think what's sad about it is if you're going to be a politician who goes to Hollywood and you're there to try to use the tools of Hollywood to um, express a values-based political message, I do have some respect for that. But that, that to me is not, I don't think, what's going on with Barack Obama. I think Barack Obama – uh, has decided, made a whether conscious or unconscious decision to desire, to just want to be a true, true celebrity, you know, showing up on ESPN and right. I mean, he, this is like Jimmy Carter is famous, but not a celebrity. Jimmy Carter, I think, you know, whether, whatever you think about his presidency, Jimmy Carter, I think has tried to use his post post-presidential fame, uh, for his values based work, non celebrity. And I think Obama, has basically decided to pursue celebrity. Regard, I mean, it's not that he's promoting bad values. I just think he's disengaged and decided, I just want to be a celebrity, right? And yeah. I think that's really kind of sad, although I'm not surprised by it, having reported on him for a very long time, basically through the reporting, coming to believe that this is a person who really doesn't have uh, very much ideology other than wanting to serve uh, uh, the ruling class. Like I think his and president serve himself, I think. Sure, That's, sure, yeah. sure. 
But I think his presidency, his presidency was a model of serving the ruling class. Yeah. And, and I, I actually don't, I, I don't, I don't know how you could uh, like on the substance. I know that might make some people mad, but I, it's kind of indisputable. I mean, he had the economic crisis that he came in. He, he was elected to deal with and, you know, pledged to um, uh, uh, crack down on Wall Street. Everyone forgets this. And he used that that mandate to hand a bunch of money to a bunch of, to a, a handful of bankers. Uh, didn't really do much of anything uh, uh, for millions and millions of people who've been foreclosed on. He used his uh, mandate to prop up the private health insurance industry and, and, and uh, prevent the creation of a public option, much less Medicare for all. I mean, these are indisputable facts. And you can say, oh, well, you know, the Republicans were, pre-. Uh, he didn't really try to do more like that was what he got what he wanted. And so I don't think when you look at that record, then you see him being a celebrity and not really engaging very much uh, on, for instance, um, you know, an economic crisis right now uh, and just basically using his platform to be a celebrity. I think those, those things are congruent. They make sense. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he came out, I think the only political acts he's sort of uh, uh, done since he left office was to uh, shut down a basketball strike and, and shut down the Bernie Sanders campaign. Yeah. I mean, this is depressing. I, I had a good He's two for two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked about this on the, on the other show, but I, I was a really good friend with a guy named Steve Bing, who was a big Democratic contributor and close friends with a lot of, a lot of very powerful people. And Steve was a wonderful guy because you could actually argue this stuff all day and all night and it would never get contentious. And um, I remember in 2008, he worked on the Hillary campaign. And um, I mean, he's close friends with Bill. And he didn't work with her in 2016. Um, think about that. And I remember sitting down with him in 2008, having this, this argument, uh, you know, we, a bunch of us would be like, you know, fuck it. No, we're, we're, we're for Obama. And I remember Steve going off on this rant about Obama. It's like, you guys all love Obama. You don't understand. He's a complete facade. He's an actor. He doesn't believe in anything. He's just looking to, you know, amass wealthy and powerful friends. He just wants to hang out and get in with the in crowd. That's all he's about. And he'll do anything. And you're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I proceeded to spend the entirety of the Obama administration, just watching him turn out to be correct. And, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I think finally in the end, and I, I can say this is somebody who, who, would, if I could, I might, I think he became president so he could hang out and do a podcast with Bruce Springsteen. Cause I would do that. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> so would David. <laughs> you know, I would I mean, choose probably someone else, but yeah. same principle. I, it's one thing I think about a yeah, one thing I think about a lot that this discussion is reminding me of, sort of a tangent, but not really, is just like the politics of who makes all the content that we see. You know, it's this, uh, like, I would say that, like, from what I've seen, a lot of the people that I know who write TV shows, who star in TV shows, you know, like, it's most people are liberal, but like, it's this it's it's an, it's a thing where they probably had a really good time during the Obama years like because of their class backgrounds you know um in terms of like how they see the world needing to change um i would say it's very well intentioned and it's representation based which i think is important in hollywood like you should have a diverse writing room you know but like Pete Buttigieg for example you know like He's gay, but his politics are the same, like, you know, neoliberal, terrible stuff that, you know, has put us in this situation. And I think sometimes, you know, like, people want to sort of, like, apply a one-for-one of, like, what's important in Hollywood to, like, what we should be doing politically, which is looking at like, okay, you know, who, who is this person, but also like, how do their policies affect people? You know, that's probably the most important consideration. And, you know, I think like in the 2020 election, for example, in the primary, like, I feel like, you know, it was, it was all sort of like Elizabeth Warren or Buttigieg, you know, a lot of people who like super hated Bernie Sanders and probably for well-intentioned reasons in a lot of cases, because it's like, yeah, you know, we're done with white guys. And like, I actually think that impulse probably comes from a really good place sometimes, but the stakes of having someone be a writer yeah, on a TV would. show <laughs> versus like the stakes of having someone be the president of the United States 
are incredibly different. It, you know, it has to be considered <laughs> yeah, that's a, differently. It's yeah. a huge thing that, that, um, uh, and it sort of goes to David talking about the difference between celebrity and fame. And it makes me insane. I mean, as the, um, you know, being right in the heart of it all the time, like the, the, the film and the TV industry, the, uh, so much of the attitude of these people sort of bleeds out to the rest of the country. But, you know, I, I, I have done things that, that, uh, you know, have, have cost me money to, to show my conviction that representation matters enormously in, in entertainment and film and television that you need to see. And not even out of some kind of, you know, highfalutin belief about it or anything. It's just like, we need more diversity in stories. I'm, I'm, I have seen every friggin' version there is of the angry white man getting his own back. Let's see some other stuff. Yeah. That's really important. But when you translate it in a one-to-one -one thing into politics, you end up with this insanity where you get this, you know, I'm, everybody here I'm looking at understands this, but the insanity of thinking that, you know, someone like Kamala Harris who built her career on, on, you know, brutalizing poor black single mothers that, that somehow she's shattering a, wait, wasn't it? Yeah. There was just, a, I think at the Martin Luther King gallery, there is now a portrait of Kamala Harris made out of shattered glass. <laughs> and I defy you to explain how she broke any kind of, I mean, she was appointed in the most cynical way by Joe Biden. She was such a bad candidate. She had to drop out. She was so disliked by people who looked like her that she had to drop out of the race and now it's like, look, she broke the glass ceiling. It's like she didn't break any break anything, and none of that is going to redound to the benefit of the people that you supposedly care about that look like her. And people simply don't understand, seem not to understand the difference between how important it is to have more diverse faces on screen, and you know how more important it is that we need to help a larger diverse population. But let me, I want to, I want to, I want to agree and disagree with you uh, just okay. on a, on a small point. I, I think it is worth, I don't think it has to be either or, I guess is what I would say. Oh, I agree. I, I don't mean, either, like, yeah. Like, I, I think that Kamala Harris actually did break a barrier that was real, that the country did elect a woman of color to um, vice president. Uh, and I think that is a, a real thing. I, but I guess, so I, so I think that is a real thing that needs to be, that should be is, or, or I, I have no, certainly no objection to that being honored and recognized. However, right. if the, the goal of the, um, of the project of politics is just to have a more, uh, representationally diverse oligarchy. That is not enough, and that, in my view, is not acceptable. Uh, that, which is to say, that if you have a more uh, demographically diverse oligarchy, you haven't fundamentally solved uh, the real issue uh, destroying this country, which is um, oligarchy. <laughs> right? Yeah. That is the real issue here, and I'm sure the oligarchs would be perfectly happy with a slightly more demographically diverse oligarchy uh, than, um, uh, than, uh, than having an uh, oligarchy either limited, reduced, or dismantled. And I, my fear is that the uh, goal of a more demographically diverse oligarchy is actually the neoliberal project to prevent the dismantling of or limiting of oligarchy. Or, and so, or at least that's how it's empirically existed. Right? Yes. So you and could so, say yeah. in, in theory, this is a good goal, but when you turn to reality, it has been used most eff efficaciously in a particular way. Well, right. So I think you're like when it comes to Obama. Instead yes. of, you know, I mean, to me, it's like the, the first, I mean, first of all, by the way, we, I think we all agree the first black woman president will be a Republican. I mean, almost inarguably. And I think it's it's way less important. And uh, I can't remember, somebody – we talked about this on the West Wing thing a while back. But the, the Democrats have decided they're going to be the party of firsts now. So everybody is the first something or other. And to me, it's like I hear that and I'm like I'm so, I'm so much more interested in the last. Like I want to hear about the last, you know, single mother to die in poverty than I want to hear about the first incredibly wealthy, powerful black woman to be appointed to some position where she doesn't do anything. And if we focused a little bit more on, you know, the downriver on, on, on the actual people and, you know, that's, that's the, and, and Democrats use that 
obsession with the first to ignore the needs of the actual people they're supposedly representing. And that's what makes me crazy. Yeah, and I think the reason that that like seeing uh, like that the veneration of Obama or um, seeing uh, 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 the the Kamala Harris display at a museum of like the glass ceiling and whatever, I think the reason. Like Obama being the first black president, I mean, it, that's a that that is a huge accomplishment. Uh, Kamala yeah. Harris becoming the first uh, uh, woman of color to be vice president, th- that is a huge a, a huge thing. However, I think the reason that that uh, what you're getting at is is that the veneration of those achievements are used or are interpreted as uh, a way to not ask the questions of well, what about what have they contributed to? What are they contributing to the cause of actually dismantling oligarchy that is economically crushing millions of people? And that that those achievements are used to, in a lot of ways, very cynically, frankly, to yeah. distract and downplay and really suppress questions about what is being achieved in the larger cause that pol- that politics is supposed to produce, which is a government of, by, and for the people. And I underscore for the people, not for the oligarchs. So I want to end on this question because I know we've got to go, but we don't often have artists on the program. So I wanted to ask each of you, and you could just answer in turn, what do you think the role of art is when it comes to fortifying a left-wing political position? Uh, this this is only a conversation that has about uh, 150 years of writing about it. Uh, but I'm just curious how you, as practitioners... Four minutes, go. Go. <laughs> I, I think there is a difference between art and propaganda and i think sometimes we all do both you know like to me like art is complicated it doesn't always have a message uh if you listen to like any of our podcasts i would say there is a message and that's okay you know but like i i don't know i think to me it's like very liberal to be like oh like this person watch this and then they're gonna end up like changing their life and their politics because they like this piece of art i don't really think it does that but i think art is fun and wonderful and it makes the human experience feel meaningful and bearable and i love all that stuff yeah i mean i think art primarily when it when it works at least um encourages empathy and exercises your, your, you know, empathic impulses. And I don't believe you can create a piece of art. There's probably one or two exceptions that can actually affect change directly, but I think you can chip away at people. You can eat away at their presuppo, you know, their, their suppositions. You can smuggle ideas into kind of mainstream entertainment that can work as kind of brain worms that can then interact with data down the line that can change people. I think that, um, and I think it's important to try to do that. Uh, but, um, you know, but, but there is somewhere there's a fine line. It's a long conversation. We don't even have, you know, five minutes, let alone an hour, but, uh, uh, I, I think it's important to try, but I also think it's important to recognize that, um, you can't tie your virtue up in the art you enjoy or that you create too much because that can be dangerous. And I say that as somebody who spent a couple of years now doing a podcast in which we dissect how much harm a TV show has done to the world. And the only thing I'd say is a corollary to that is if I accept that the West Wing did do damage to the world, and we've spent a lot of time detailing exactly how it did, then I have to be able to acknowledge the fact that you can also do good with art. I I would only add add to that. I fully agree with what Josh just said. I would only add that I think art is another way to shape people's thinking and to, and to, and to, to, to prompt thought. Um, I I think, um, uh, Oh, prompt thought or, or create, create ways to continue thinking. I think for instance, the West wing was, was a, I mean, I don't like calling it propaganda in the sense that I guess if, if the West Wing is propaganda, all art is in some ways propaganda. But propaganda, we're saying, in, in, infused with a message, infused with a set of assumptions, infused with a with a desire to shape thinking. So the West Wing had a desire to shape thinking around norms, around what's politically possible, what's not possible, what's realistic, who's who's serious, who's not serious. All of whose value judgments, uh, I, I uh, frankly, and assumptions and missions, I disagreed with, uh, um, or, or at least most most of them. Right? Um, I think, for instance, the movie "Don't Look Up" tried to use uh, art. That was an art, you know, a, a, a piece of uh, a, you know any 
you know, I'm not saying it's like high art, but I'm saying it's like, you know, a, a creative endeavor was designed to try to, uh, in some ways, make people uh, ask questions uh, and, and, and wrestle with really uncomfortable and frankly terrifying uh, uh, problems and questions in our society. Uh, I don't think it prescribed a certain outcome. Uh, I don't think art has to prescribe a certain outcome, but I think it's the, it, the best art, in my view, is the kind that uses the art not to reinforce um, uh, necessarily uh, the norms and standards of what's going on now, but to get us to ask uncomfortable questions that maybe we can't verbalize or maybe that aren't allowed to be asked um, on the nose in other formats like news or and the like, that you can raise uncomfortable questions, like the court jester, if you will, can raise, uh, you know, as the trope goes, the court jester can raise more uncomfortable questions in front of the king than the, than the you know, than the, the, the member of the king's, uh, the other members of the king's court because the court jester is kind of sh shrouding it in art and i think that's the best art is the kind that makes us like really struggle with things that are scary or too uncomfortable to talk about in other formats and then just that's a really small well thing said. too and that was a perfect example because i think there were there were, i saw a lot of people sort of on the left complaining about don't look up um uh you know and it was like this movie's not for you this you you don't need to hear this message they were sort of you know it's not sophisticated it's not whatever it is you know and i'm like a, I thought it was ridiculously entertaining, and B, you could see how it's it's making a very powerful, simple, compelling case for people who don't want to think about this or who don't normally think about this. And and the thing with all art is, you know, who's the audience this is for? I mean, I remember the movie Philadelphia drove me crazy because it was like, oh, yes, you're so, you know, forward thinking. You can't even have Tom Hanks kiss his husband or his boyfriend, Antonio Banderas. Meanwhile, my grandmother's watching it, and she's going, damn, I guess those gay people are all right. <laughs> you know, it's like... The movie wasn't for me, but it was reaching people. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've got to go now. And everyone, thank you for listening. Thank you.